and has no um, secret motives or any uh, or uh, um, and, and he's he's always he's he's just the greatest. So uh, thanks Ed for being here and um, go do it. Go for okay. It. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, it's true. I'm I'm an open book, but. Uh, um, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today um, is this is actually my kind of pitch for the kind of work that we're doing in the lab. And it's increasingly um, less necessary given the kind of work that I saw student presentations in, from Paul's lab um, are, are focusing on that, you know, this, this move to uh, doing a lot of in vivo work in, in zebrafish is really exciting. I'm happy to see it taking off at, uh, at Servo. Um, and so I'm going to, what I'm going to tell you about is some of the methods and techniques that we've developed for doing, um, imaging in the brain in, in mostly in Xenopus, but a little bit in zebrafish. And I think the goal here is that it's a system which is really accessible. Anybody can set it up in their, in their labs. It's not actually very expensive, um, whether it's zebrafish or, or Xenopus. There's different advantages to to the two systems, and so you know I'm gonna do a, a pitch for Xenopus here. You know, catch you guys while you're still early on in your careers. For people, and and a lot of you guys are engineers, right, and developing um, tools for opt optogenetics and and um, imaging. And this is where I think our model is really uh, beneficial because first of all, it's inexpensive. You know, we don't have the kind of costs of maintenance that the, the mouse labs have. But also, it's really easy to take essentially, you know, to start with a plasmid and go all the way from plasmid to in vivo 3D light sheet image in a matter of days. And so if you're somebody who's developing tools for imaging or, you know, either, either on the optic side or on the genetic side, um, it's a really powerful uh, test bed. So I'm going to bring you through a little bit of the, the history and what we've been doing and hopefully uh, get you guys excited about it. So can you all see just my, my screen? Can you see my mouse? Yes. Good. Okay. Thanks guys. And also please uh, feel free to like chime in with questions at any point, just interrupt, speak up or um, I'll put the chat window up. Make sure that I can see the chat. Hmm. Sorry, it's covered over at the moment. There we go. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> this is my home base. It's McGill University, and I work up here at the Montreal Neurological Institute. So you just have to take a stroll down through the Reddit gates, extend all the way down to the Montreal Neurological Institute, and you reach my lab. Um, what I'm going to start this talk with is just a little bit of history about imaging synapses in vivo and, um, and cells in vivo. So this, I think, I always show this every year, is what I believe to be the first example of in vivo imaging of a synapse. Um, and it was done in the 1980s by uh, Dale Purvis and Jeff Lickman. This is, this is from Jeff Lickman's study. And it's, you know, considering uh, that technologies like two photon imaging didn't exist at the time or was, was not a, in extensive use. It's kind of impressive what, what he was able to do. He, he screened for a large number of dyes, fluorescent dyes, that would actually stain synaptic elements. So uh, they ended up using a styrol dye here that was apparently taken up by mitochondria. And because mitochondria are so dense um, at, at synaptic terminals, when you um, stain, this is a peripheral muscle, the sternomastoid muscle, so right by the neck. <clears throat> and if you uh, stain this with a, the, the styral dye. Uh, what happens is it takes up the dye. You can still image while it's alive. And they're able to then capture images of an, a motor neuron end plate on, on the muscle. So <clears throat> it's not the central nervous system, but it is a synapse. And it's an important one for understanding synaptic development. And, you know, the images that they were able to collect are, they're not stunning, but you can really make out um, the sort of pretzel shape of the, of the end plate. And um, they were, uh, one of the things I love in this paper is that they, they give the dates in which they were able to image repeatedly at the same site. And, um, you know, you can see that many months apart, 
they are able to go back and find the same structure at that at that snaps. So, you know, this was sort of pioneering work allowed them to make a lot of conclusions about what happens at synapses during development. But really, this kind of work took off with the advent of genetic tools, and in particular, the use of, of GFP and GFP derivatives to label uh, motor neurons and, um, and neurons in general. So this is the same system now. But in this case, imaging uh, YFP and CFP labeled um, you know, um, stochastic uh, expression of motor neurons. And in this case, you have two, this is development. And so what you have are two motor neurons terminating at the same end plate. In the adult animal, there's only a single motor neuron that takes over the entire end plate. And so you can see this process of takeover in which one of the inputs actually gradually displaces the other one, causing it to retract over time. This is another example of that where the retraction bulb is very clear. So this idea of synaptic, um, uh, um, you know, this takeover notion and, and competition at a synapse and the ability to actually image this in vivo. And so, you know, one of the nice things also at the neuromuscular junction is that you can stain the postsynaptic side with low concentrations of fluorescent bungarotoxin, which binds acetylcholine receptors. And at, at low concentrations, it doesn't block function very much but it still allows you to visualize in red the postsynaptic sides. You've got the pre and post in the same structure. Um, and Lichtman made an incredible uh, uh, career out of this kind of work. Now, you'll notice that the scale of this structure is enormous compared to a typical central nervous system synapse, right? Which is on the order of a uh, fraction of a micron. So when we <clears throat> want to study more complex uh, motor units, it's possible to do um, imaging at the light level and make out, you know, a lot of the, this, these, this is just a few uh, motor neurons labeled and their projection to different terminals on the muscles themselves. Um, you can look at single uh, axons or you can look at this group of axons terminating in a region and, you know, follow them over time during, during development or in adulthood. The, um, the challenge though, is that if you want to study this process developmentally and what changes over time, you really need to be able to reconstruct single axons. So, you know, in this case, you can sometimes pull out a single expressing um, motor unit, but it's more useful if you can get multiple motor units in the same prep. And so, you know, at this level of resolution, it's really easy to do um, a segmentation of the images and digitally separate out the individual axons that project to the different um, motor units and generate these kinds of beautiful um, reconstructions of complex uh, inputs to the, to the periphery. So, you know, this is the kind of work that allows us to come up with a wiring diagram, but obviously in the peripheral nervous system, it's much, much easier because of the, the scale and the fact that the um, axons aren't so densely packed together. Now, when we move to the central nervous system, the problem becomes much more challenging, right? So, you know, this is a typical image of hippocampal cells. Um, these are GFP expressing lines from Guoping Feng, which are essentially the, you know, the standard, um, the community for imaging. There are many different lines that have expression um, that end up in different cell types. But as you can see, if you want to really understand the complex structure of something like the hippocampus, it becomes this forest of, of cells. And you can, you know, find specific lines that have very sparse, low density expression, and you can use those to pull out uh, morphological information. Um, but really, if we want to understand how this circuit functions, we need to be able to get, you know, both high resolution and also single cell resolution images from, from the prep. And people have argued, you know, this, this is an example of an image. I think you guys in your lobby, you have this beautiful spinal cord section from Ramon y Cajal. Um, and, you know, all of his, his drawings are really impressive, in part because he was able to um, extract or, or infer function and the direction of information flow uh, just by looking at the anatomy. And part of the way he was able to do that is to be able to visualize multiple cells in a structure. So to get the, the circuit information, but his understanding of the, the fact that these were individual neurons functioning as individual units 
came from being able to see one cell at a time using the Golgi stain. Um, and it's hard to sort of overstate the importance of the Golgi stain for this advance. So this is an image of, you know, what a Golgi stained neuron looks like. Uh, these are drawings from Cajal and there's this really nice um, text that Cajal wrote in his, in his Histologie du système nerveux, where he kind of describes the, the first impressions he had upon looking at, um, at Golgi stain material. Bear in mind that before that, people were using stains that would reveal kind of gross structure of the of nervous system tissue. But this ability to see single cells was a really important breakthrough. So I'll read it out loud because I think it's really nice. He said, against a clear background stood, stood black threadlets, some slender and smooth, some thick and thorny, in a pattern punctuated by small, dense dots. All was sharp as a sketch with Chinese ink on transparent Japanese paper. And to think that this was the same tissue which, when stained with carmine or longwood, left the eye in a tangled thicket where sight may stare and grope ever fruitlessly, baffled in its efforts to unravel confusion and lost forever in twilight doubt. Here, on the contrary, all was clear and could plain as a diagram. A look was enough. Dumbfounded, I could not take my eyes from the microscope. And I think any of you who have done imaging know that you've had this experience of just seeing this extraordinarily beautiful and complex cell under the microscope. And so for Cajal, seeing these, you know, in many cases for the first time, um, the, the passion and, and ideas started to flow. So one of the reasons that Cajal was able to, um, to do this kind of work, in addition to the existence of the, of the Golgi stain, was that he had access to really high quality German uh, optics um, and in his microscope. And so the sharpness of the images that he was able to collect was actually superior to what Golgi was able to collect on his own microscopes. And it may be one of the main reasons why Cajal actually um, was able to come up with this neuron doctrine, the idea that, so that the ner nervous system consists not of a, a mesh of, of interconnected wires, but rather of individual cells separated by synapses, just that higher level of resolution. So the things that you really want for biological imaging then is improved signal to noise ratio, right? That's the, that's the name of the game for imaging in vivo, no matter whether it's functional or structural. And there are basically two sources of noise the biological noise, that's the complexity of having millions of cells within this tiny chunk of brain tissue. And you wanna be able to study the structure of just one of those. And then of course there's micros microscope noise, which um, essentially makes it uh, difficult to, you know, it's the, it's the issue of having improved, improved optics, improved ability to, to resolve um, the structures that you're looking at. And we've had a lot of, of um, important innovations in, in the last couple of decades for biological noise, this ability to get genetic expression in single cells. And for mic microscope noise, obviously two photon microscopy um, has been in light sheet microscope, micro microscopy techniques that allow you to essentially extract the complexity of three dimensions and focus on single dimensions is a really important part. But every, every improvement that we can make um, will allow us to understand more and more about the system. So <clears throat> what I'm going to advocate for today is to kind of try to get the best of both worlds. Um, what I say here is that a true reductionist approach to studying the brain, um, brain development and function requires both cellular and circuit level analyses. So we want to be able to see single cells, but to really know what's going on, I think we also want to look at them in the intact circuit. So this image, which I just randomly pulled off the web, um, consists of just these beautiful dissociated neurons in culture. But I'm wondering, what are these neurons thinking about? Um, this is a great model for studying. Yeah, exactly. This is a great model for studying neurons and, and um, the processes that occur at the single cell level. But if you want to study and of course, even contacts between cells. But if you want to study the complex circuit, you really need to go to a more complex structure. 
the, the, the in vivo system. And so, you know, it's kind of like asking, um, here, here's this spark plug. Um, and this is a dissociated high performance automobile. How, how fast can this go? So we really want to get back into the, the sports car. And so <clears throat> approaches to, to get us there have obviously involved the ability to pull out within the intact brain or within um, uh, original tissue, uh, the individual cells that, and, and pull them out um, optically. So uh, the approach that many people um, have, have shown and have, have um, you often see this in talks about the, the nervous system is, was developed by Jean Livet and again, working with, with uh, Sainz and Lichtman. This is the brain bow approach. Um, and the idea here is that you can get stochastic expression of a number of different fluorescent proteins um, in different uh, ratios in cells so that each individual cell has its own kind of color profile, right? It's spectral profile. And then you can use spectral analysis to um, separate the individual cells. Now, it turns out this is much harder to do well in practice than, than in theory, but it does generate these beautiful images of the, the complexity of the central nervous system. So here's the, the hippocampus that we were looking at before, now shown in, in its full glory, all of these cells in the dentate gyrus and, and what a forest this is. So <clears throat> I like the term that Jeff Lickman uses, which is if we want to study neurons in their natural setting, we, we need to all become neuronal naturalists. Um, and this actually is a quote that I stole from Stephen Smith, um, who was one of the first people to do in vivo two photon microscopy, in vivo veritas. I think um, if we really want to know what's the, um, the function and the, and the role of uh, cells in the nervous system, we need to go back to the in vivo crown. But it's hard to do in vivo imaging, right? So um, if you put a, mice, a mouse under a microscope, um, you've got to control body temperature, make sure that its respiration is good, anesthesia monitoring, right? All of these, these issues, if you're working with an animal that's, that's anesthetized to get stable images. Uh, you've got to make a cranial window, um, and there's a number of different approaches for that, but it's all quite um, open to, um, to complexity like infection, inflammation, uh, things that are often overlooked, the, the consequences of, of, of heating. Um, there's a limited ability to image really deep. So, you know, it, it becomes increasingly invasive and expensive to image deep into the brain. Um, you may have to insert, uh, you know, grin lenses or uh, perform tissue aspiration or have, you know, very, very um, uh, high tech and expensive approaches, three photon excitation. Um, and of course, there's respiratory artifact and, and other and other movements. And I appreciate that um, at the servo uh, and in this course, you guys are probably learning all sorts of approaches to get around these problems. So, you know, this is really fantastic and allows us to move these things forward. And of course, the ideal scenario is to do all of this in an awake behaving animal, and that makes things all the more complicated, right? But what I'm going to suggest is that there's at least for the early steps of this process, there, there is a better way and, you know, keep it to yourself, but um, we can actually image in vivo uh, without having to do any of this stuff above by taking advantage of the, the Xenopus and Superfish models. So, you know, I, I'm kind of glad that I'm speaking today because um, the person who follows me, I guess, is still Tim Murphy. Is that right? So Tim is the example of the opposite of this, right? He's the one who's figured out how to do all of this stuff in a really elegant way. And so, you know, you'll hear the other side um, and he makes it look easy. But, um, you know, I'm going to sort of show you the, 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 the dummies version. So these are the aquatic species that we're using in the lab. Um, they're very easy to rear. They're inexpensive. And as you can see, they're, they're bodies and brains are highly transparent. So, you know, this is a Xenopus tadpole during the stage when the retinotectal system, which is the visual system that we study, is really undergoing its, its sort of greatest um, uh, development and, and segregation. And so it's a really, you know, easy prep. You can take the animal, stick it right under the microscope. Um, it's big enough that, you know, somebody with, um, you, can, you, can, you can see it quite easily. Yes, it'll be recorded. So, um, uh, 
obviously zebrafish as well, even more transparent than Xenopus. There are some subtle differences. You can see that the size difference is pretty substantial. The brain of the Xenopus tadpole at this stage is about the size of the entire zebrafish head. And so for things like electrophysiology, um, it's much easier to record from cells in the Xenopus tectum. Obviously, um, the genetics of zebrafish uh, makes it more powerful for, for genetic-based approaches. So what I'm going to show you is a little bit of the work that we've been doing to try and you know, identify single cell structure in the uh, retinotectal system and then look at functional imaging. So this, this is basically the retinotectal projection of Xenopus, the system that we're, that we're largely focusing on. Um, we use, our, as our main method for expressing green fluorescent protein, we use electroporation, and I'll show you why um, it's so convenient short, shortly. This is a stage 48 tadpole, which as I said, is that stage when there's an enormous amount of remodeling going on in the optic tectum. And we can just, you know, inject plasmid into the eye, electroporate, and this is what you get. So um, this is the optic nerve projecting into the tectum. This is the structure here. And these are the terminals of the axons from the eye. Okay, this is a, a histological section from the optic tectum itself. And you can see that it's laid out in this nice layered structure. So you've got the neuropil region here where the synapses uh, are formed and then a dense cell body region here. Um, and I think if you look here, these are the, the main components of the retinal axons, which come in from the contralateral eye, terminate on the dendrites of the tectal neurons. And then there are these radial glial cells that um, are actually functioning as astrocytes in this population, and they have these fine processes that extend. And it's pretty straightforward to use electroporation to label these cells. And so you get um, images like this. So this is a two photon image of three retinal ganglion cell axons that happen to be labeled growing into the optic tectum. And what's nice here is that we caught them at three different developmental stages within the same prep. So this axon has a big growth cone at the tip and is growing towards its target. This one has already reached its target and has extensively um, ramified, but they're still highly dynamic at this point. And so um, if you look, I don't know how well you can see, but um, you can see the axon, the growth cone extending through the neuropil, and then the fine processes of the um, axons extending and retracting branches. Oops. This is a tectal postsynaptic neuron, and you can see that they two are extraordinarily dynamic. This is an image uh, that I got from Kurt Haas's lab. And um, what happens in the developing nervous system is that the axons grow into their target. The dendrites actually extend and retract, making occasional contact with the axons. And when the dendrite contacts the axon, uh, often a synapse is initiated, and that will result in at least transient stabilization of that contact. And the entire structure of the retinotectal projection is built up through this kind of intermittent contact leading to either stable or dynamic um, interaction. And then the glial cells, these radial glial cells, which have this nice brushy um, appearance in the neuropil, when we imaged those the first time, we were quite surprised to see how dynamic they are. So this is just a 30 minute loop. Uh, and I apologize for the blue. I don't know why that happens. Um, a 30 minute loop showing that they're extending and retracting fine processes, which we've shown have actually actually make contact with the synapses themselves. So you've got this nice model where you've got the pre post and the glial component all um, easily accessible and imageable. And then, of course, there's this fourth element, which um, uh, we've only started studying recently, and that is the microglia. So this is an example of everybody's favorite kind of uh, Im imaging project, which is to induce a small lesion in the optic tectum or in the, in the brain, and then watch how the microglia actually pile on. So this is a, um, an MPEG GFP transgenic line, but it's also been labeled using um, a dye, IB4 isolectin. The red is the isolectin. You can see that the isolectin doesn't give as good uh, labeling of the microglia, but it's perfectly useful when you have an you know, you want to study microglial interactions with, um, with neurons and you don't have the transgenic line um, available. Ah, again, the video, weird. Um, okay. Um, is there anything I wanted to say here? No, just to make the point that in 
might in zebrafish and in xenopus, unlike in mammals, the microglia are this wandering population. And so when the lesion occurs like this, ah, I'm really sorry about that, it does seem to produce this pylon where cells come in from quite distant locations and are attracted to the site. So it doesn't take a large number of microglia to surveil the entire optic tectum structure in these animals. It's probably on the order of two, three dozen. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I know it's just a single image, but like a few slides ago, uh, that brain slice looked extremely similar to uh, to zebrafish. So I was just wondering, like, how similar are both brains? This one, right? Yes. I think they're they're extremely similar. The scale is a little different. So um, one one neuronal cell soma here is on the order of ten microns diameter. In a zebrafish, it's more like four or five microns. And so that's one of the reasons that I still kind of um, rely on on Xenopus is that it's quite easy to do whole cell uh, voltage clamp recordings in these cells. It's a bit harder to do that sort of thing in the, in the small neurons of the zebrafish. Um, but in fact, in terms of the layout of the structure, it's really similar. The zebrafish tectum develops a laminar structure much earlier, but by the time these guys are adults, they'll have a nine layered um, optic tectum, just like a mammal. Okay. Thank Thanks you. for the question. Yeah. Okay. So what are the uh, techniques, techniques that we can use to do single cell labeling? Obviously, you know, there's the standard genetic approaches where you might inject DNA into the developing, um, embryo and then have stochastic expression, um, in the animal. But if you want to target your expression, a really powerful technique, and this works in zebrafish as well as in, in, um, in Xenopus, but it also works extremely well in um, mammalian tissue, is single cell electroporation. This is a technique that was developed by Kurt Haas um, back when he was working with, with Holly Klein. We were, we were actually postdocs together. And the basic approach, you know, it's it, uh, I, my postdoctoral supervisor, who similarly developed a, a, a very similar approach, said that this is the kind of thing that requires uh, knowledge of molecular biology and electrophysiology, um, not, to, not to execute it, but to have come up with the idea. And that is basically that you, you set up as if you were going to record from the cell, but then instead of recording, you, you uh, ionophores. And so the prep involves then bringing a micropipette, essentially a, um, um, a whole cell voltage clamp type um, glass micropipette, filled with plasmid DNA solution right up against a cell. So in this case, we can visualize the cells very easily as in as you would in a zebrafish as well. Um, you go right up next to the cell that you're interested in, you pass some pulses of current and there are different approaches that are used. Um, normally in the demo, we show that you can use either high frequency um, 200 Hertz pulses to get um, electroporation, or you can use a kind of um, one and a half millisecond pulse with a capacitor stuck in the path. So uh, in this case, uh, the capacitor is not, not shown, but we would stick a capacitor in um, parallel uh, for the stimulator output. And that produces this exponential um, curve, which is quite nice because you disrupt the membrane of the cell with the, with the peak of the curve, and then you continue to force DNA into the cell in, with the um, decline. And what you end up with is, you know, roughly 12 to 24 hours later are nice single labeled cells. If you do this um, improperly, you end up with clusters of cells, but, you know, just by changing your positioning or the shape of your pipette, it's very easy to get this um, optimized. And, you know, you, you have beautiful uh, single cell resolution of Golgi type quality. And this is just an example of the approach that my postdoctoral supervisor developed in the lab um, when I was there. And it's the same thing. It's basically um, single cell electroporation, but in this case, it's in a uh, organotypic slice of cortex. So the approach works perfectly well in cortical sections as well. And you can do it in vivo, but it's tough, right? Because you, you can't necessarily see the tip of your pipette and you need to have your pipette right up against the cell that you're electroporating for this to work. Basically, the way this works is that when the cell is, is away from, when the tip of your pipette is not touching the cell, the plasmid will just flow into the extracellular space. And as soon as you get right up against the membrane, 
it disrupts the membrane enough by passing current through it that you generate micropores within the plasma membrane that allows the plasmid to enter the cell. And in fact, the, we think that the plasmid actually doesn't just enter the cell, it has to enter the nucleus to get expression. And so this is one of the reasons the sort of low efficiency of the whole procedure is why it's relatively straightforward to get single cell labeling. So if you wanted to do this in, you know, in vivo, you need to be able to position your pipette really carefully. And so one approach that can be used is this shadow patching approach where you inject a fluorescent eye into the extracellular space. And then using the contrast image, you can bring your um, electroporation pipette right up against uh, a single cell shown in contrast here and electroporate either dye or, or DNA into that cell. But that's, you know, it starts to become a little bit more complex, right? So there's another way to get um, labeling using electroporation that doesn't give you single cells, but it, it's really, really efficient and easy. And that's the bulk electroporation approach. It's, you know, it's the thing that, that probably most um, mouse labs would be using. You can do it in the spinal cord. You can do it in early development in utero um, and label cortex very easily or hippocampus. Here in the tadpole, we use bulk electroporation just across the, the ventricle of the plasmid, of the um, tectum. And you can see that you get unidirectional, unidirectional delivery of plasmid into the cells on one side, and you can see the axons projecting across to the contralateral side. There's the occasional cell that gets labeled, but for the most part, um, this is a nicely unidirectional approach. So it's easy, you inject plasmid, you, you know, you've got lots and lots of cells labeled the next day. So for electrophysiological approaches, this is great. You know, you have lots of cells to record from if you wanted. Um, and I think the same is true with um, in utero electroporation. Of course, the time is, this is 24 hours or 48 hours later. Um, in mouse, it will be a lot longer. The negative though, is that you've got, you know, a little bit lower co-transfection efficiency. It's probably around 85 to 90%, which is still pretty good, but you can't assume that just because a cell has one, one uh, construct, it has the other, if you wanted to inject two constructs. And of course, this issue, getting back to the, you know, getting single cells is really where it's at, um, that's problematic here. So and this is just an example of hippocampus that had been in utero electroporated. Um, and so these are just, you know, this contrast of the two images, the whole brain electroporation in young animals gives really, really dense labeling of not every cell, but a large number of cells in the optic tectum. This is a two photon step through the optic tectum from top to bottom. And then this is the single cell electroporation technique on roughly the same scale. So the question is, can we take the benefits, the advantages of this bulk electroporation approach and be able to get the strengths of single cell electroporation. And so one idea we had was that, well, what if we just reduce the concentration of plasma that we electroporate? <clears throat> would that kind of reduce the frequency of electroporated cells to the point where we would have stochastic and, and very uh, sparse uh, labeling? And to some extent that works, but it's problematic because as you lower the concentration of plasmid, you also lower the brightness of expression of whatever it is that you're, you're trying to um, express. And so this is just an example where we go from, you know, two micrograms per microliter of DNA down to 0.1 micrograms per microliter. You can still get, you know, single cells and some labeling, but it's much less expression and it's not great for that, that high resolution, you know, the high signal to noise that we're, that we're really going for. So in, in the lab, we developed this approach called, we call Cremsicle, which is cremediated single cell labeling by electroporation. And it's, you know, it's not brilliant. Uh, it's basically just this idea that if you in, electroporate two plasmids, there's some probability that um, only one plasmid will get into the cell. And so if you have a really high concentration of one plasmid and a really low concentration of the other, the number of cells that have both plasmids is going to be very low and, and you'll get very sparse um, co-expression. And in this case, the two plasmids that we use are a GFP, which has a stop codon introduced um, between two LOX P sites, so that essentially it doesn't express in the absence of Cree recombinase. And then the other plasmid is Cree recombinase itself. And when, when we express Cree recombinase, we use very, very low dilution. So we basically have somewhere between uh, 5,000 
to 10,000 times more GFP plasmid than Kree plasmid that we electroporate. And the consequence of this is that you end up, so as you reduce the concentration of Cree that you're co-electroporating, you end up getting this situation where you've got pretty much single cells. Another advantage to this is that this approach tends to label very immature neurons, neurons that are often quite difficult to target with single cell electroporation because the cells that tend to get labeled by bulk electroporation are the ones closest to the ventricle. And so those are usually the most immature. So, you know, this approach works not only in, you know, in the optic tectum of, of uh, tadpoles, it would work in, in fish, I, I'm pretty sure, although we haven't tried it, um, but it works in mouse. So many years ago, Mike Kerr um, at Yale wanted to do some labeling of single cells in the retinocollicular projection. And he was having this problem that he was getting, you know, large numbers of axons labeled every time he did electroporation um, in the in the retina. And so we suggested that he try this this crimsicle approach. And the consequence was that he was able to get really nice single cell labeling in the um, in the retina, and then be certain when he would reconstruct a, an arbor in the colliculus or in the lateral geniculate nucleus that it was really coming from a single cell in the eye. So it does work in, in uh, mammalian tissue. The other approach that has been kind of a clever way to get single cells out of bulk electroporation or bulk genetic expression is to take advantage of optical highlighter proteins, right? And so you, you've probably all seen this kind of approach. There, um, there are many different optical highlighters. The ones that we've looked at are photoactivatable GFP. This is still really a, a very, very useful and very, um, very efficient um, highlighter protein. And then there are photo switchable proteins like KIDA or KICGR, um, which I guess um, maybe uh, have the advantage that you can see the cell before you photo activate it, but and you just switch, switch colors, right? And many times these kinds of proteins are used in uh, super resolution imaging. So I think you guys probably have access to all, all kinds of really great um, optical switchable proteins. So the approach that, you know, this is a paper, um, not from us, but in zebrafish, in which they used a chiidae expression, expressing line and were able to show that you could basically at will identify cells for highlighting, shine a 405 nanometer um, laser uh, UV light onto the, the cell of interest and basically convert it to red. And so, you know, single cell morphology can be extracted in this approach. Um, the problem with using 405, obviously, is that you don't get um, the nonlinear optic advantages of single, single plane targeting, which may be important for this kind of approach, but you get the idea. We've used photoactivatable GFP and we just co-express it. So this is basically a retinal, retinotectal projection. We've electroporated M cherry and photoactivatable GFP into the retina. And so this is the optic tectum. You can see the axons from many, many uh, tectal neurons projecting into the optic tectum here. This is a skin cell, it's autofluorescence, so just ignore it. But basically this is what the image looks like before activation. We then pick one site right here at the tip of one axonal terminal, and we concentrated our photoactivation um, of photoactivatable GFP through the two photon at that location. And we were surprised. We thought that we would probably get just local um, expression. But the turns out that fluorescent proteins in neurons are they, they diffuse really, really rapidly throughout the cell. I was quite shocked by how, how rapid the diffusion is. So this just a few minutes later results in an image like this, where you can see the entire axonal arbor filled from this one location in the uh, optic tectum which is pretty amazing. And so from this approach, you can see that it's possible to pull out a single cell um, and all its morphology from uh, bulk electroporation. So those two approaches are really quite powerful. The, the um, Kremsicle method doesn't really allow you to pick which cell will be expressing. This one obviously has the advantage that you can target individual cells for lighting them up. And a technique developed in Herwig Beyer's lab which I think is just really very clever is the Fujima approach, which kind of combines functional imaging with um, this photoactivatable uh, fluorescence labeling. The idea is to express, so this Fujima construct basically is a GCAMP6 um, plasmid that is co-expressing photoactivatable GFP. 
And so what happens is you can image um, evoked activity or whatever kind of, of activity you're interested in studying in the, um, the cell body. So it's a nuclear targeted GCAM. So you pick the cell body of interest based on its activity profile. So you know, we want to study direction selective neurons. So you find a cell that exhibits direction selectivity in the GCAM signal, and then you just photoactivate right over that, that um, soma, and you end up labeling, filling the entire cell with photoactivatable GFP. And you can do this over and over again and end up with a nice complex wiring diagram for uh, functionally identified cells. I really like this idea. And then, of course, you know, the ability to make transgenic animals makes um, everything much easier. And, and um, uh, I think in Xenopus, there's this P transgenesis kit. So you've got a, a wide spectrum of different uh, constructs you can use. Cree, um, sorry, um, uh, I think with CRISPR, it's gotten even easier these days to make, you know, transgenic animals um, and it doesn't matter the species so much, right? We're trying to make knock-ins now in the lab. We've, we've, been ha we've had some luck, we think, with um, uh, the NMDA receptor. So that's kind of cool. Um, but I think you guys have seen, I saw some of the students showing images from this paper from, from uh, Herwig Byers group where it's possible to use basically um, enhancer lines that express um, basically uh, Cree, or in this case, it's, um, it's GAL4, in a subset of the cells in the, you know, in, in the brain. And then by taking advantage of variegated expression, so a bit of stochasticity in the, in the expression of GFP, it's possible to get animals that just have one or, or two um, fluorescent cells. You can then take um, a kind of um, universal atlas, a statistical atlas of the zebrafish brain, and impose all of the different reconstructions into that atlas. And I think uh, what, what Bayer showed, which I was kind of blown away by this, is that you can, you know, by doing this approach almost uh, painstakingly one by one, you can reconstruct a very complex wiring diagram. It's not, it's not a complete diagram, but it's the, com the level of complexity and, and um, uh, sophistication that's possible to attain using methods like this is really quite amazing. And I think this makes zebrafish quite a, a powerful model for, for circuit bashing. The other approach that's kind of a cool thing, and I haven't seen it used very much, and maybe that it's technically too challenging, but I, I really love the idea, is if you just express um, calcium indicators or activity um, reporters in cells in the brain, in, in theory, there should be a much, much higher degree of correlation in the activity of, um, or the calcium within a single cell than even in neighboring cells. And so in principle, by generating correlation maps of, of images, you should be able to pull out the structure that underlies that, that, um, that particular cell. And so, um, this is work in which this was done in, in Xenopus in the, in the um, olfactory system. And, you know, they, they expressed, uh, in this case, it was a, a, a different um, calcium indicator than, than we're using now. But uh, by looking at the calcium signal uh, across an entire image of the olfactory bulb, and then looking at correlations within the image, they're able to basically determine that, you know, these are all inputs to this particular glomerulus. And you can do this over and over again, looking at the correlations of um, different locations and extract just by, by, the, by, by imaging over time, the sites with the highest degree of correlation in the image. And that gives you pretty good structural reconstruction. So this is a video. This is again, the olfactory bulb in Xenopus. So we pick one site look at the calcium activity, and then do a correlation map throughout the entire structure, and you can get images like this. And then you pick different glomeruli, different sites, and all together, you're able to identify um, different inputs to 
to identified structures. You know, these are these are still pretty small structures, like 40, 50 micron diameter structures in the brain. So this, I mean, this is super cool. It doesn't, we've tried a lot to get this to work and it's not so easy to get high signal to noise, but I think this, this is worth investigating further. Um, and of course, the classic image that everybody, it's like the mandatory image for a presentation on, on this kind of a method is the work from Misha Ahrens, uh, basically doing whole brain light sheet imaging of GCAP. And that's, I think, one of the real, um, the greatest advantages of a transparent model like this is that you really can do whole brain imaging um, at, at high temporal resolution. And I really like some of the, the other approaches that I heard about, the high-low approach, for example, that you guys are doing. Um, looks sounds really cool. So, right, so rapidly scanning through the brain and generating the nice uh, three-dimensional um, reconstructions of activity. So in, in our lab, we're not doing light sheet, but in part because the animals are, you know, we're interested in the visual system. And so the light sheet we feel would introduce maybe some, some uh, artifact, but we do do rapid focus, you know, high speed two photon through the, the image of, uh, through the uh, optic tectum in order to collect this kind of information. It's not as fast, but it's still pretty good. And so, you know, the goal, I think, for people like me is to be able to watch the animal actually watching the stimulus, right? And so this kind of thing, which just five years ago was was kind of a fantasy, was a, this was to me my dream experiment. This is from uh, uh, Muto et al from, from Japan. These are, this is the group that developed GCAMP 7, and uh, but an earlier version of GCAMP 7. And it's, it's just quite amazing that you can actually make out in the optic tectum, if I go back and play this again. So this is a paramecium, which is what superfish like to eat, as you guys probably know. And if you take a, the G-Camp expressing animal, this is the optic tectum here. You can actually see the representation of that paramecium in the brain of the, the animal in, in real time. It's super cool. I mean, you're watching this animal, watching the, the prey. So that's kind of the goal for, for my group to be able to um, do that kind of thing um, and use that methodology then, not just to get pretty pictures, but to understand um, what are the mechanisms of map formation in the brain. So there's one advantage in Xenopus that is actually, I don't think it's possible in zebrafish, although we haven't tried. I, I think there are reasons why it won't work in, in zebrafish, but Xenopus are, you know, they're externally fertilized just like zebrafish. And just like nice video to show the process. On the left, it's the initial post-fertilization image. And you can see the, the cleavage and then the division into, into two cells and four cells and eight cells. Um, and then on the right are later stages of development of the embryo. And all of this occurs over a matter of days, right? So you can get to a pretty mature embryo. The, the embryos that I show you in, um, in the earlier slides were about a week, a week and a half after this initial fertilization. Um, so, you know, the subsequent process of going from a tadpole to a, to a small froglet is kind of cool. And there's, there's a interesting Xenopus unique issues here as the eyes actually move on the head, you'll notice as the animal develops, the visual system is actually has to keep up. It has to basically remap itself in order to accommodate the fact that it's looking at a different part of the world and we can see remarkable changes in the anatomy that occur um, in parallel it's kind of cool to understand what's going on but what i wanted to show you actually was this, this cleavage issue so when the you fertilize we do a lot of in vitro fertilizations to generate tadpoles and at that first step of of uh, cleavage you get two cells right two blastomeres and this is something that in Xenopus, the blastomeres are big, they're physically separated, and it's pretty easy to go in and micro-inject DNA or morpholinos or, or um, mRNA into one of the two blastomeres, and they're not connected. So you end up basically expressing what, or whatever you want in that one blastomere and all of its progeny, all of its descendants. And if you're lucky, this doesn't happen 100% of the time, but about 25 to 30% of the time, 
you inject one side of the animal and you end up with a half animal expressing your gene of interest in just one half. This is a whole tadpole. I don't know if you can see it, but you know, the right half is completely not visible under fluorescence because it's not expressing um, the, the fluorescent protein. The left half is where we injected the fluorescent protein and you can make out the, even the brain is, is like Harlequin divided right in half, which is pretty cool. But it's especially cool for us studying the visual system because the retinotectal projection is a crossed projection. So the axons that originate on this side almost exclusively terminate on the contralateral side. There's very rare exceptions. Um, and so that means that in one animal, we can look at the presynaptic cells on one side, and we can look at just the postsynaptic cells on the other side and uh, ask questions not only about structure, but also about function. So GCAMP injected like this gives you, this is the retinal ganglion cell axons imaged on the contralateral side. So that's the neuropil region. And we're just flashing lights of different intensity, different luminance into the, the eye. But it's kind of beautiful to be able to see all the retinal ganglion cells and pretty much no postsynaptic cells in this image. And so we can extract information about topographic maps, functional uh, properties. And this is where I would really like to be able to use that um, uh, correlation-based structural imaging if, if there's any way to get that to work because, you know, there's the possibility of pulling out hundreds of individual retinal ganglion cells from, from an image like this. This is the contralateral side, uh, the ipsilateral side, the injected side. So here you've got your tadpole. This, in this case, this would be the side, uh, sorry, this would be the side that was injected. So we zoom into the optic tectum. There's the cell body layer. Um, and one of the nice things about this mRNA injection approach, so we inject mRNA against GCAMP6, and that every single cell on that half of the animal is expressing GCAMP, which means the glial cells are expressing it, right? The retinal axons from the other side are not, um, but the tectal neurons are. And so we can then use, you know, cell um, segregation methods to pull out both the individual <coughs> neurons. This is just spontaneous activity, but also the end feet of the glial cells are really quite clearly visible in this case. And so we've been taking advantage of that to look at neuron glia interactions to um, you know, image calcium evoked by visual stimulation and see how it correlates with neuronal activity. Um, and again, you know, this is where I wanted to kind of highlight, if you're somebody who's making new fluorescent proteins, so you know, Robert Campbell's group is, is making really cool uh, new fluorescent proteins, calcium probes and, and other kinds of probes, what is possible is for us to get the plasmid Convert it into mRNA. That's you know a, a week of subcloning at the most um, to generate um, mRNA. Inject into one of the two cells, or or even into both of the cells, and you can then get a, basically an animal in which we're able to see all of the neurons. Um, in this case, in the olfactory bulb, expressing and this. This was a near infrared gecko too, um, that Robert's lab had generated, and so we then took these animals to the light sheet microscope. Let's see if this will play. Maybe I have to hit play. And so this is this is light sheet imaging um, of this near infrared uh, fluorescent protein. It has an interesting property of being um, bright in the non-calcium bound state and then getting dark when it binds calcium, um, which has some advantages. It has disadvantages with respect to uh, fluorescence uh, ble bleaching over time. But, you know, we were able to do all of this in under two weeks, you know, from, from receiving a plasmid in the mail to capturing a 3D light sheet image, um, which I think, you know, I would say is almost impossible to imagine doing in a mouse. Okay, so um, for my lab, <clears throat> we're interested in studying the emergence and development of topographic maps. So the approach that we've used is to take advantage of the, our ability then to express GCAMP in these different compartments present visual stimuli to the animals on a video monitor while the animal's sitting under the two photon microscope embedded in agaros. And, you know, we can either do kind of reverse correlation type stimuli where we flash a, a bar at different locations in the um, visual field, or more often what we do is we sweep bars. I don't know how well the, the videos come through on Zoom, but it's just a bar sweeping across the visual field. 
<clears throat> and this is an approach that's actually used for mapping. Um, uh, you know, it's been used for a long time in, in fMRI and in intrinsic signal imaging in that if we present a stimulus at a regular duty cycle, you know, if, if the bar sweeps across the field um, once every 10 seconds, then if we pull out the 0.1 hertz response within the um, within the tectum, so I guess I have some images. This is what it looks like as it sweeps. So this is sped up quite a bit, but we've got in one case um, the stimulus sweeping from front to back, and in the other case the stimulus sweeping from back to front. And I think you can make out the kind of movement of response across the optic tectum. And then we just do the um, for each voxel we do a Fourier uh, power spectrum. We pull out just the signal at the frequency of the visual stimulus itself, right, of the sweeping bar. And that essentially is a great way of controlling the, you know, raising the signal to noise. So we're getting rid of any sort of irrelevant responses. And then by looking at the phase at that frequency, it tells us, you know, where in the, in the cycle was the stimulus. And that corresponds to then the position in the visual field. So <clears throat> right as the bar sweeps across the field, there's going to, oh, I don't know why it does that. There's going to be early elements um, that have an early phase and then later phase corresponds to things that are at the other end of the, the sweeping bar. And we can generate then maps like this. These are topographic maps at the subcellular level of the visual system in, you know, in the uh, optic tectum. So this is a map for the postsynaptic cells. This is a map for the presynaptic inputs um, using these approaches. And uh, I think what's nice is that not only do we have the ability now to see maps at stages where when people were using you know extracellular electrophysiological recordings in the old days they would have claimed that there was no map simply because this, this structure is so small right i mean this is a probably a hundred 150 microns in this axis and maybe 400 microns along this axis and so the seeing distance of a typical extracellular recording electrode doesn't give you the resolution you need but with optical approaches as you can see right quite nicely <clears throat> and so we can do elevation maps and azimuth maps within the brain. Um, look at how different manipulations might alter the formation of the map. One of the things that was a bit surprising to us was that if you look at these two maps, so this is an, az an azimuth map and an elevation map. It turns out that the animals don't see very much over the uh, top of their heads, but they do tend to see a lot more below. Um, the orientation of these maps is not orthogonal. I sort of was expecting that they would be perfectly orthogonal to one another, but it, we've, we found that if we image the same animal over time, and I don't have this, this data to show you, but what happens is that the maps actually become increasingly orthogonal over time as the map develops. So that may be one of the properties that emerges with development. So what I showed you before was a single optical section, but if we do optical sections through the entire tectum, you know, rapidly while presenting these stimuli, we can generate not just a single optical section map, but the map in 3D throughout the entire neuropil of the tectum. And that gives a lot more information. Um, and I think this is one of the first times that a three-dimensional um, topographic map has been studied from the initial development of that projection. In fact, we're able to follow these maps in, in these animals from almost the day the axons arrive in the optic tectum until much, much later when a complex map has formed. So there's a lot of, of power now for understanding the formation of maps. This is the elevation map in that same animal. So I don't know, I mean, probably this is, for me, this, this is hard, hard won data. I, I've been wanting to, to get this information for years and years, and it was really only GCAMP, uh, actually GCAMP 6 made this possible. I think that um, as these indicators improve, it just becomes almost trivial to get this kind of data that we struggled to get in the old days. So there are the two sort of almost orthogonal axes of azimuth and elevation represented in 3D. So I'm really happy that we were able to get this information. And now we can go in and do manipulations, right? Uh, genetic manipulations or um, even activity um, manipulations. So the first thing that we would do is to ask um, what happens if you block NMDA receptors, right? And 
We know that NMDA receptor blockade has a pretty dramatic effect on the retinotectal projection in terms of single cells. So even the dynamics of axons, when you wash on NMDA receptor blockers, you see an actual increase in the rates of branch addition and branch retractions over a very short um, period of time. So these are images from Holly Klein collected many years ago. Um, and what she showed is that when you, you know, apply APV, you get an increase in the rates of additions and retractions um, in the arbor, suggesting that NMDA receptors are important for stabilizing the projection and that blocking NMDA receptors lead to this increased dynamism. Um, and we thought that if we blocked NMDA receptors, the map would be totally messed up. And that we were quite shocked <clears throat> that what we found was that the maps were almost as good in NMDA receptor blocked animals as in, as in wild type. So this is just single optical sections from a control animal and an MK to one reared animal. This animal was reared in MK to one from the you know, earliest innervation of the retinal axons. This is the postsynaptic projection. This is the presynaptic projection. And you can see that they're actually pretty good maps in there already. Um, this is the azimuth map. This is the elevation map. Really, they're not that different. Um, we can quantify this. The way we quantified it was by looking at a, a measure which we call local discontinuity. And that is essentially how grainy is the, is the map that's generated in the neuropil. So for any one voxel, if you look at the surrounding immediate vicinity, it should, if in a really smooth map, there should be very little difference between the um, preferred position in, in space that drives the, you know, the, the receptive field center that drives that voxel and all of its neighbors. Whereas in a more granular or less refined projection, you might expect to find that there's a high, higher difference between that central voxel and its neighbors. And what we found was that it is true, MK to one rearing actually significantly increases the amount of granularity, the discontinuity, um, both in the postsynaptic side and in the presynaptic side. And it's true for azimuth and it's also true for elevation. So NMDA receptors are important for refining the map. But I think what's more striking here is that the difference between pre and postsynaptic maps is much, much greater than the difference between you know, NMDA treated and not. And so one of the reasons that the presynaptic map is more granular than the postsynaptic map almost certainly is that the postsynaptic cell is integrating across many inputs, right? And selecting um, appropriate inputs. And so you, it's, it's more of a, it's a higher level, right? It's, a, it's the refined um, processed version of the raw inputs coming from the axon. So that makes sense that it should be less discontinuous. But the fact that there isn't, when, when we do statistics on this, there's no interaction between pre post versus MK to one treated and control, which, which indicates that this difference between pre and post is not due to NMDA receptor function. It's probably due to some, you know, other processing going on in the dendrites and in the cells. So that was a bit of a surprise after so many years of single cell imaging and being convinced that um, NMDA receptors were the thing that refined the map. It turns out that, you know, they have a role, but it's much smaller than we initially thought. Um, so what are the NMDA receptors doing given that they have this, this role in, in um, sharpening the map? How are they doing it? So, you know, one approach is to just look at single cells and, and image, like I showed you, uh, dynamics or structure and ask what blocking NMDA receptors does to that. I think the problem with that approach is that we know that these mechanisms are highly activity dependent and NMDA receptors, of course, are glutamate receptors. So if you block NMDA receptors, you're kind of screwing up patterned activity within the network. Maybe not, you know, not as badly as, as would happen if you blocked AMPA receptors, but it's not a clean experiment because you're not really um, just getting rid of NMDA, you're getting rid of activity at some level. So in order to understand this a little bit better, what NMDA, what, what is the com contribution of NMDA receptors? We took advantage of uh, a gain of function rather than a loss of function approach. So in these experiments, so basically NMDA receptors consist, you know, of four subunits, typically gluN1 and gluN2, or here NR1, NR2, NR2 subunits, are the subunits that bind glutamate. It's the gluN1 subunit, the NR1 subunit, that actually binds the coagonist glycine or D-serine. 
And so we reasoned that if we provided an excess amount of D-serine in the system, that we would be able to enhance NMDA receptor activation. So you know, rather than blocking it, we would be able to really enhance it. But the dependence on released glutamate would still be there. And so we wouldn't be creating abnormal patterns of activity per se. We would just be enhancing whatever activity is present and the, the amount of calcium that enters into cells during um, glutamate binding. So we tried rearing animals in um, in glycine, in sorry, in D-serine. We could have done glycine, but the problem with glycine obviously is that it's a it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter as well, and so it would have given a, a bit of a confound um, confounding result. D-serine doesn't really have a lot of other targets. It may have a few, but they're in much, much fewer. And so what you can do then is you record from a cell in the optic tectum. This is an evoked NMDA receptor response. So you'll notice that this is in the absence of magnesium. So that's why we can get an inward current when we stimulate. So we stimulate the optic nerve. We record from a tectal neuron and just ask, you know, what is the NMDA component of that response? This is with AMPA receptors blocked. And if we wash on D-serine, we find a pretty substantial enhancement of that, of that response. So this tells us two things. It tells us that D-serine is effective at enhancing the, um, the currents through NMDA receptors, but also it tells us that in a normal animal, the NMDA receptors don't have saturating levels of D-serine present or of glycine present. And so by adding more, we can actually truly enhance NMDA receptor function. This is just to show that the D-serine wash-on, which causes about a 200% increase in the size of the currents, uh, can be washed off pretty, pretty much. And so we reared animals for two days in, uh, in D-serine, just putting it in the bath. And the consequence of that is that we get um, an accelerated level of synaptic maturation. So the way we measure synapse maturation in this system is by looking at the AMPA NMDA ratio and mini frequencies. So if a synapse starts off having just NMDA receptors, right, then what we believe happens is that in response to uh, patterned activation that drives, repeatedly drives NMDA receptor activation, it causes the trafficking of AMPA receptors to the surface. And the two consequences of that are that you'll have a higher uh, mini frequency as you unsilence many synapses, and you may also have an increased amplitude, although not necessarily if the main um, effect is, is, um, is unsilencing silent synapses that were initially NMDA only. And then the other effect is, of course, the NMDA AMPA ratios will change. So this is just the mini data, so spontaneous activity recording from tectal cells. And we see a small but non-significant increase in D-serine reared animals in the amplitude but a very large increase in the frequency indicating that silent synapses had become matured and, and unsilenced. And these are the uh, AMPA NMDA ratios. So you see that for any given set of inputs, the relative contribution of AMPA increases relative to NMDA in D-serine reared animals, indicating that the D-serine treatment resulted in AMPA receptor trafficking to synapses. So we're driving maturation of synapses by allowing NMDA receptors to, to be enhanced. What are the morphological consequences? So for postsynaptic cells, if we just look at the structure of those cells over, over four days, what we find is that D-serine rearing causes the cells to grow much more slowly. So they tend to be more, you know, more stable and less exploratory. And that's, you know, these are just two examples of cells over four days with the D-serine added after day zero. And you can see that on average, the, the length of the arbor and the number of branches increases over time. And the Scholl analysis really clearly shows that the most distal branching processes um, is, is not taking place in the, in the uh, D-serine reared case, suggesting that the inputs onto that cell are essentially, you know, as the cell is growing, it's sort of telling itself, okay, I've got enough input I don't have to grow anymore. I don't have to search for more inputs, perhaps. And that's just one interpretation. Presynaptically, we see the predicted change in dynamics. So the opposite of what is seen with EPV treatment, when we look at D-serine treated animals, we see a substantial decrease in the number of branches added and the number of branches lost 
over a one hour time lapse imaging period. So again, that suggests that there's a higher degree of stabilization. We think that this is likely due to a retrograde signal that's generated from the postsynaptic cell and feeding back to the presynaptic cell. And I don't have the data to show you that, but we've done knockdowns using this half animal approach of NMDA receptors just in the postsynaptic cells. And when you do that, um, these effects actually are lost. So you, the deserine treatment only affects morphology of axons if the postsynaptic cells express NMDA receptors. So what is the effect on morphology over time, over days? Um, normally a cell goes from having a very simple arbor to you know, this denser, more complex arbor over, over this three day, four day period. Deserine rearing has this remarkably powerful effect on limiting the arborization of the axon. So just as it, it made the, um, the dendrites remain simpler, um, the axons are almost frozen in their position. They're still actually dynamic. You can go in and watch them um, you know, with some level of dynamism, but it's much lower than a control. So they're, they're presumably healthy, um, but it's almost as if they're hyper-stabilized. And we can show that this is not making the cells sick, it's really an NMDA dependent effect by just going in and adding MK801 uh, to block NMDA receptors together with the deserine application, which should you know, prevent that enhancement of NMDA uh, activation. And when you do that, you basically rescue the effect. So you get normal or relatively normal arbors. So this is the, um, the morphometric analysis. Branch number is pretty much flatlined for deserine animals, but um, continues to increase if you block NMDA receptors or look at controls. And that's true for arbor size as well. Okay, so um, that's kind of the, the way that we think that NMDA receptors may be contributing to stabilization of the developing system. And we, you know, it makes sense that correlated activity will activate NMDA receptors and drive the stabilization. What about synaptic pruning? There's been you know, the, the elimination of synapses. So for years, people have been talking about the immune system and uh, microglia and the role that they may play in, you know, in synapse pruning or in, in refinement of projections. And the data have been pretty, um, I would say indirect, right? You, you do something that knocks out a particular uh, microglial gene or, or alters microglial function, and you see a disrupted projection. And Again, we thought, okay, here's an opportunity to use live imaging to look at the interactions between microglia and axons and see whether there really is something happening there. So um, this is an example of an eight hour time lapse sequence of you know, bulk labeled retinal ganglion cell axons. And you can kind of see them extending and retracting over time. Although again, this is because it's bulk label, it's hard to make out individual things. Um, and then in red, it's the microglia labeled with that IB4 lectin, right? So you can see that the microglia are not just wandering around outside of the neuropil, but every once in a while, they'll dive in and, and wander into the neuropil, right? So there's opportunities for interaction. And we can actually, you know, kind of go in and find individual cases where the, the microglia are interacting directly with the axons. And this is, this is pretty cool because if you were to just image this, uh, image of the axons without seeing the microglia, you would see these occasional movements of the tissue. And you might think that that's just artifact, you know, the respiratory, uh, not respiratory, but um, blood flow or an, an unstable image. But when you have the microglia there, what you can see is that in many cases, the microglia are actually sort of forcing their way through the neuropil as they wander through and explore. And you can see them Sort of pushing axons out of the way as they grow in, which is, is really amazing. I wouldn't have thought that that degree of, um, you know, that, avail that, that amount of space was available for them to move through. So we see both, you know, microglia wandering into the neuropil and microglia extending processes into the neuropil region where they contact the axons. Is there a possibility then that they're actually, you know, phagocytosing axons during this process? <clears throat> we use the term trogocytosis, which refers to not eating entire cells, but just nibbling, like taking little bits and pieces off of the cell while it's still intact. 
And um, Tony Lim, a postdoc in the lab, was actually able to do these like long um, heroic imaging sessions where he captured the microglia in the act of troglocytosis. So here you can you can see the white represents co-localization of GFP and uh, the red dye, the Alexa 594. And I don't know if you saw it, but in this case, the microglia starts off with a low level of green fluorescence associated with it. Some of that is autofluorescence, but after interacting with the, the axon, it actually has a higher level. It's maybe even clearer in this case. I don't know if the videos play. I hope that they play smoothly. So here's an axon that comes in, spend some time interacting, sorry, a, a microglial cell, spend some time interacting. It wasn't red at all when it, uh, green at all when it came in, and now it's wandered off with a, a bit of green associated with it. So, you know, this, this could be um, an increase of autofluorescence. It could be the actual transfer of GFP from the presynaptic cell to the microglia. How can we assess this more, more quantitatively? Um, you know, what's, what's actually happening? So if you imagine that microglia are interacting um, with some kind of, you know, come hither signal, eat me signal that the axons are, are um, expressing, then we ought to be able to, to alter that signaling and alter then the amount of transfer of material into the microglia. And that would be a pretty strong indication then that it really is transfer. So one me mechanism that's been widely cited is the complement pathway. So there's these complement proteins that are in the extracellular space, and they can occasionally bind to the surface of cells. Sometimes there are active um, uh, mechanisms by which they're drawn to the cell, but sometimes there's just uh, redox reactions that will spontaneously cause them to become associated with the surface of cells. And they probably have to be cleared away or inhibited in some way to avoid the cells becoming completely decorated with them over time. But if a cell does accumulate enough complement C3 on its surface, then it will recruit microglia through the, the complement uh, uh, CR3 receptor, C18, and um, bring microglia in, presumably to, to phagocytose the, that uh, bit of axon. So if we imagine that the cells might be able to fight this off by expressing a complement inhibitory molecule, that might be a nice way that activity could control the interactions of microglia with the um, with the axons and prevent this this pruning from taking place, right? So the question is, does such a complement inhibitor really exist? So one thing we can do is to just try to overexpress complement C three um, on the surface of cells artificially and see whether that increases the the nibbling. Is that nibbling idea really? complement mediated. And a, a simple way to do that is just to, you know, clone complement C3 from Xenopus and make a construct which will put complement on the surface of cells, specifically at synapses. So um, what Tony did was to make a synaptobrevin vamp 2 construct, which has complement C3 on its, you know, fused on its um, extracellular um, or luminal surface. And so these cells that are expressing this construct will be extensively decorated with complement at synapses. And so what happens to those cells? What Tony saw was that over the course of a few days, the um, complement C3 expressing cells actually grew considerably less than the control cells. So suggesting that there may be some interaction then with the microglia. So this is the quantification. I don't know if it's large enough to see, but you can see that the size of the arbors, um, and these are pretty high ends, was, was much smaller for the complement um, expressing cells than for the controls. Oops. And um, arbor complexity as well was greatly reduced in those cells. So this at least is a kind of proof of the concept that complement may mediate axonal uh, pruning or prevent the arborization of the axon when it interacts with microglia in some way. Um, what about that inhibitor? So Tony did, um, a bioinformatics screen looking for Xenopus proteins that might have complement inhibitory domains. And he identified a number of candidates, including um, the homo homologue of human CD46, 
Um, this is called um, Amphibian Regulator of Complement Activity, I think, ARCA-3. Um, and ARCA-3 was immediately stood out as a good candidate because it's expressed at high levels in neurons. This is a CD46 um, from the Allen um, uh, data set, and in, in, I think in, this is mouse or human. Um, and so you can see it's highly expressed in neuronal populations. These are, uh, I think, excitatory and inhibitory neurons represented in two colors, so excitatory here and inhibitory here. And the other candidates that he found that had these complement inhibitory domains were expressed at very low levels in neurons. And so he, he really wanted to focus on, on this particular one. Um, and so, comp, you know, this amphibian regulator of complement activation, that's what it's called, ARCA-3, um, really does have the closest homology to human CD46. There's some slight differences. I mean, structurally, they both have repeated complement inhibitory domains on the extracellular surface, but the CD46 only has four of them, whereas ARCA3 actually has eight such domains, but it's actually quite common among um, uh, CD46 homolog homologs for the number to differ between species. So that's not too surprising. So, okay, we think we're looking at the amphibian homolog of CD46. So Tony ex expresses CD46 then in the axon, and he asks, what is that going to do to arborization and to microglial um, uptake of GFP? So how do you measure the uptake of GFP without sitting there at the microscope for eight hours hoping to catch one of those lucky interactions? Um, one thing is to just measure the amount of green fluorescence associated with microglia. So um, what he does is on the first day, he electroprates retinal ganglion cell axons with a pH stable GFP. He labels the microglia with IB4 lectin. And then he images in the optic tectum. So this is what you see. You see the microglia in red, uh, two axons here labeled in green. And then on day four, he counts the amount of green fluorescence associated with the microglia. So the way he does that is he creates a mask from the microglia and just asks how much green fluorescence is associated with that masked microglial um, territory. And then he does the same thing the next day on day five. Okay? And so that question then is between day four and day five, on average, how much did microglial green fluorescence increase? The other nice thing about this approach is that he can count the number of axons, of green axons, in the, um, in the tectum. Uh, these are retinal ganglion cell axons. And if an axon dies, then all bets are off, right? You don't want microglia to pick up the, the green fluorescent protein from a dead apoptotic neuron. And that's, you know, half of the neurons will die from apoptosis during this time period. So that's a real confound. But what's nice is that we can follow those axons pretty much from the moment they arrive in the tectum until the end of the experiment and know that none of them died. None of the GFP positive axons have died. And then we can just do this quantification. So um, here on the left are just control um, cases expressing GFP. And if we compare day four to day five fluorescence, you can see that there's a wide range of different fluorescence levels in the microglia, but there's no increase over time. In contrast, in animals that had one to four axons expressing GFP, there's a significant increase from day four to day five in the microglia associated fluorescence. So that's a pretty good indication that it's really coming from the axons itself. And then, you know, there's an even greater increase if you start with, with more axons that have been labeled. Now, if we express ARCA3 uh, together with GFP in those axons, pretty much all bets are off. We lose the uptake of uh, GFP from the microglia, suggesting that, in fact, this complement inhibitor is preventing the microglial phagocytosis or trogocytosis of GFP. So what the purpose of that trogocytosis is, is not entirely clear. We can't say for sure that it's involved in true synaptic pruning. But one thing we can do is go in and just look at the axons and ask, you know, do they grow more or less when they express ARCA3? And it's already quite apparent that ARCA3 expressing axons are much larger over time, so suggesting less pruning of the arbor, although it could be contact-mediated signaling. It's hard to say for sure. So they're both, both branchier and larger overall. So it does really suggest that that uh, complement-mediated signaling is calling the microglia over and causing this interaction.
Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you. Um, obviously, we couldn't have done any of it without the really great team of people in the lab. Tony, uh, who did that microglia study, is also an avid 3D printer. So he made this, um, this image from this photograph, and this is Tony here. Marion did the, um, the uh, deserine uh, rearing experiments together with Zara. Um, and I just want to, you know, acknowledge the, the support over the years and thank everybody for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ed, for an excellent talk again this year. Thanks. Any questions uh, for Ed? I think it's pretty yeah. straightforward. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you've talked a lot about the optic tectum and and all, but it, is it a future plan to try those experiments in other regions of the brain to compare the arborization or NMDA or whatever? Yeah. So I mean, the optic tectum in uh, in fish and frogs obviously is the like it's the most salient structure there. It's it's like a quarter of the entire brain at these developmental stages. So it is kind of an, an obvious first target. But I think the other area that's of quite great interest is the olfactory bulb. Um, it doesn't seem to be as much um, NMDA receptor interactions there. But in terms of, you know, a nice model system where it's possible to observe um, developmental plasticity, learning, uh, the olfactory system is actually quite cool. And so um, and especially for activity imaging, right? So uh, I think at some point it would be nice to get into that as well. Um, I don't know. I, I think for now that's that's enough to keep us busy. We barely understand the optic tectum yet. But uh, what were you thinking? Was there a brain area of, of uh, particular interest? I don't know. <laughs> I was just curious. One thing that you know, one of my colleagues does that I think is really quite nice is the optic tectum. It's it's called optic tectum, but it's actually a multimodal structure, right? It's an it's an integration center for uh, tactile and auditory as well as visual inputs, and so it's kind of nice to be able to study that uh, multimodal integration at the level of the tectum. And so again, with calcium imaging, perhaps using different um, some of, some of Robert's. Uh, different color reporters, it might be possible to look at different inputs and the activity there. Great, thanks. Thanks. I also have a question uh, regarding the famous tectum. Yes. Uh, could there be a way to correlate the, the synaptic pruning and all the, the molecules that you name to the, the retinotopic maps of like the, the moving bars and see how well they maturate and with the discontinuity and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've tried it for NMDA receptors. Um, we've also done it for D-serine. It turns out a little bit surprising to me was that D-serine actually makes the receptive fields slightly smaller, um, but it's an interesting result. Um, but yeah, the one of the cool questions would be, what if we removed the, um, the efferent cues that are thought to guide the initial layout of the map? Um, in studies that were done decades ago, it's been suggested that the activity dependent, you know, elements, components are much more important, for example, in a regenerating map than they are in a, um, that first initial map, in part because molecular guidance cues are setting up the map. So you take away the molecular guidance cues, now you've created a situation where perhaps activity is, is the only game in town, and, you know, then is it conceivable that we could have, you know, we could exercise much greater control by presenting different patterns of visual stimuli. Like it would be very nice if we could shape the map by presenting, you know, correlated stimuli in different parts of the visual field, right? Do you think that initial map would be completely random? It's a good question. I don't think so. I, I think um, there's a strong, I mean, assuming the activity component is there, there's strong reason for it to be continuous. But it might be that it's got, you know, almost the same probability of being front to back as back to front. Um, it's something that would be, and what is the behavioral consequence of, of an inverted map, for example?
I don't know. Those are those are kind of fun questions. I'm not sure that it, that it'll work. Nature probably has a lot of built-in safeguards to prevent that kind of thing, but it, there is evidence, at least for regenerating projections in, in the adult. So if you sever the optic nerve in an adult frog or fish and allow the axons to grow back in, they initially grow everywhere. They just cover the entire tectum, and then it, over a course of weeks, they prune back to re re reconstruct a map. And it's probably using activity rather than efferens at that point, although it's unclear. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. All right, everyone. So enjoy Tim's talk and uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Ed. That was great. Uh, the microglia stuff was very cool. Um, very impressive. Thanks. Thanks for sure. uh, uh, the the D serine. So so I, I missed the, a little bit of the for a few seconds. Uh, the D serine is just bathing. It's just incubation in, in the water, or is it the special? Yeah, no, we just we just put it in the water. Um, so it's... is there any way that have you, have you ever come up with a clever way to have some sort of more local D serine? Uh, injection so that you can control sub-regions? It's hard, right? It's an amino acid, but what we have what we have done is injected the enzyme that degrades it. So there's a D-amino acid oxidase, and because that's a protein, right, it'll yeah. mostly stay where you put it. So ah. we inject that into the tectum, and we can get... Now, I, I don't know if... We, we haven't found a way to get it in, say, you know, one part of a cell, but we could imagine decorating a cell with uh, D-amino acid oxidase. That might be interesting. The other thing is, you know, endogenously, we believe that the D-serine is released. It's probably released by both neurons and glia, um, but it, it's it's complex. But it's probably synthesized by neurons and then transported to glia for vesicular release. So we are trying to do some experiments where we block vesicular release with tetanus toxins and dominant negative um, VAMP to, you know, make the microglia incapable incapable of releasing D-serine and then ask what happens in that in that case. And there we can get, you know, very localized. We could just, you know, electroporate 10 micro, 10 uh, radial glia in one part of the tectum and compare it to other parts. Right. So when you, uh, uh, this is just sort of random, but what, what, the RNA experiment, uh, when you, you know, the gecko one, uh, what stage were you injecting the RNA? Uh, right after fertilization. So, you know, we, we add sperm, wait a half hour and then inject. And, and you were imaging how many hours or days later? That's about a week later. So you still have expression, uh, a week later after. Actually, uh, it's quite already... amazing that it, this is a problem. If we want, you know, we want to study a, a, a functional gene right? Because you'll have it expressed for the entire time up to that point. So right. ways to control it, the, the turning on of, of, my, of mRNAs would be kind of cool. But, um, but for GCAMP, surprisingly, it doesn't seem to do any harm. And it, its expression is really highly persistent. It stays expressing for about 10 days or so. We have some transgenic uh, tadpoles that are expressing GCAMP under a beta tubulin promoter. And sadly, they stop expressing at the same time, <laughs> so it doesn't get it doesn't buy us anything except a slightly brighter signal. So is that is that just because the, the protein is so stable, or is the RNA surviving some time? I'm not sure. Um, well, we haven't done enough different proteins to to know for sure what the relative stability is. Is this why the Pfizer uh, vaccine works? Well, uh, yeah, I definitely was thinking about this, right? That. And we're more or less, I mean, if we were to put it in lipid, um, if we were to lip effect, then we'd have the same, the same result, right? One thing we haven't done, I've been begging someone in the lab to do this, is to electroporate mRNA. It's a, it's a trivial experiment, mm -hmm. but I think it would be way more efficient. You know, the DNA has, I think it has to get into the nucleus when you electroporate it. The mm -hmm. RNA, of course, does not. And so I, I think if you wanted to target a region of the brain for high levels of, of expression in a spatially and temporally controlled manner, that might be fantastic. Or inject it with a, a lipid 
Uh, yeah, yeah. It's true. Okay, we should let the students go because they yeah. have to uh, come back in five minutes. All right, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Thanks. Again, Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 I'm gonna. I'm gonna say close. hello to Cynthia. Yeah, we'll do. She's still. She's doing okay. Yeah, she actually her paper is almost out. She's. Oh, nice. re, it's in review right now. So. What is it? What is it about? It's um. It's this uh, maternal immune activation model. That's the same story that we've had for years, and yeah, yeah. it's it's gotten better. Um, but one of the one of the things we had a big microglial part of that story early on. And gradually, we had to take it out because we realized the microglia were were not. Uh, we were getting rid of microglia using um, uh, morpholino, and right. we discovered that they were, they actually come back after about four days. Ah. So that's why she's made these transgenic lines that should have no microglia at all. So, like the next step is to really figure out what the role of microglia is in this whole maternal immune activation. It doesn't look mm -hmm. like it's that important. It oh. looks. It actually looks like her. She gets high levels of TNF of of um, IL one, and the IL one expression is probably highest in the skin, right? Because okay. the animals are being bathed in this LPS, and so I actually think it's it's skin IL one that's getting into the bloodstream and making its way to the brain, and then having these very rapid effects on neuronal remodeling. Nice. Yeah, and in some ways that makes it more like the maternal immune activation, right? Where the maternal immune system is is generating the cytokines and causing, you know, autism susceptibility in the in the offspring. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a better model. I was kind of hoping the microglia were going to do everything, but it's not so simple. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I was listening to your students' presentations, and um, I would have loved to try some of this stuff with, you know, the like the um, the high low imaging that sounds like it's really it's really a neat a neat uh, the what imaging you said the high low a high low yeah 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 I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm still skeptical skeptical I mean of course Valerie made a nice uh, it, you know it's trying to make it work but um, I'm not sure whether it'll be all that useful for zebrafish imaging to be honest I guess the, it's a question of um, uh, temporal resolution is that the problem and 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 but even the signal i mean it's still i i don't know she she hasn't collected enough data it's, okay, it's, yeah, it's still early on. She, she has spent uh this project has been sort of difficult uh on the technical side and it's it's, it's extremely slow so i to be honest i i don't really know i see well so, to her credit uh, she she made well, it she made it sound very exciting so. Yeah, she's very good at it. That is very good at that. So uh, anyway, it, I mean, it's it's fine. It, it's fine that she does that, but uh, I'm not so sure. No, I, I mean, I think I think Danielle Danielle hasn't been paying much attention, so that's the problem. But anyway, okay. Danielle has too much on his plate. Yeah, I could imagine. And so he, this is a pro, this is sort of a, a project that he's not so interested. in. It's so you know, sort of a letter letting her, and she's, she's she's sort of the biochemist who doesn't really know optics, and she, but she wants she wants to do it, uh, but she, she she's not being coached very closely, mm -hmm. and so it, and so it's a bit slow. You know, I should really go into uh, introduce Tim. So, uh, okay, yeah. but I want to talk more uh, about zebrafish and microglia and stuff because uh, you know we have. I've, we've got some ideas and I've got some new people. So. Yeah, no, that's definitely I, that the the whole microbiome stuff sounds really cool. And then yeah. the uh, the calcium imaging is still the analysis is something that you guys I think are way ahead of us on. So I'm, well, this guy Antoine that was asking you uh, this question, he he's really uh, keen. So he's uh, he's pushing things right now. He's done some cool analysis of of existing data from Misha Aaron's and mm -hmm. you know been playing with this other thing from. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the German guy um, that you showed his paper. Um, oh, here with Bayer, Bayer. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, he he's really he's, he's really uh, keen. So uh, 
eventually we should we should we should we should have a meeting uh, and discuss what he's done and have your input and your ideas yeah yeah i mean one of the things we've struggled with is in these um lps reared zebrafish yeah um you know we've done analysis calcium imaging analysis of receptive fields and visual uh -huh. response properties and stuff like that but it's been, you know, it's been an exercise in data mining trying to get effects out of that. We we ultimately ended up like filtering the data to the point where we were only looking at cells with responsiveness to particular, you know, like with orientation preferences or right. certain spatial frequency preferences and then asking how do they change? Like it really ended up being a, a heavily filtered data set to get any anything meaningful out of it. Okay. And I think it's part of that has to do with just the fact that we're not asking the right questions. So Right. Well, that that ends up often being the case. All right. All right. Well, let's let's have uh, let's get together soon. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Thanks so much. And, uh, See you later. À bientôt. À bientôt.